So we're going to start with Bob Schunk from Utah State University talking on outflow and mass flow. And his partner in this is a Bill Lotko from Dartmouth College who will follow. Okay, so the task I had is, I was charged with is to, what do we need from the magnetosphere community? And, and I took it from the point of view in the coming years. Okay, and then they said be a little bit provocative, maybe even controversial, but clearly you don't want to be controversial if you have proposals into the programs to be reviewed. So I stayed away from purely controversial topics. The first thing I want to talk about is the spatial and temporal resolution that we're getting from the magnetospheric models. Um, they're really not adequate at this point. I mean, great progress has been made in magnetospheric modeling, but the resolutions are not relevant yet to real ionospheric simulations. So that's somewhat controversial, I guess. In the ionosphere thermosphere system, most of the structures are mesoscale, what I call 100 to 1,000 kilometers in length. And so you really have to model them. Therefore, you need the appropriate resolution from the magnetospheric models if you're coupling them. And it looks like the dominant mass momentum and energy coupling in the MIT system is on these scales or smaller. Now, why does that matter? The system is nonlinear. The ionosphere thermosphere system is nonlinear. So if you take a certain amount of energy and momentum and dump it into the ionosphere on mesoscales and drive the thermosphere, thermosphere, you get a certain response. If you take that same energy and momentum, spread it out over larger ionospheric scales and drive the thermosphere, you get a totally different thermosphere. And we've shown this in some of our previous work. And I think other people have also shown that. So clearly, you want to get to the scales that are relevant if you're coupling the magnetosphere to the ionosphere thermosphere system. So here I just listed, and it's not all consuming. I, I didn't list everything, but you've got propagating plasma patches. They've been known for 40 years. Propagating atmospheric holes, propagating polar wind jets, neutral streams that are flowing in the uh, thermosphere. Of course, you've got sunline arcs. Those of you who are in, in the field know this. Theta aurora, boundary and auroral blobs. You got stationary polar wind jets. You know, you got polar wind streams, subaural ion drift events. Um, and then you have storm enhanced densities, they were shown. So basically, what I'm going to do is run through a bunch of slides. I don't want you to get lost on the detail. And certainly, the students and the young postdocs might not be able to follow the details. But what I want you to do is just look at the big picture, get a bird's eye view of what needs to be done in the next decade. And you're going to find out that if you're in the area of magnetospheric modeling or measurements or magnetospheric coupling to the ionosphere, thermosphere, plasmasphere, or polar wind, the field's wide open. There's a tremendous amount of new first-rate work that can be done. So what causes these structures? Well, you get changes in the solar wind drivers. You've got structured electric fields coming down from the magnetosphere, structured particle precipitation. You've got time-dependent variations that occur, of course, when the solar wind changes in time. You've got delays and feedback mechanisms between the different elements in the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere system. And you've got inherent plasma instabilities in the different systems. So these are just some examples. I'm not going to go into detail here. But these are, these are propagating plasma patches. They're about 1,000 kilometers in length, 200 kilometers across. And this is over Greenland. They used an all-sky um, camera to see that. These are sunline arcs that occur for Northwood IMF. And again, they're around 1 to 2,000 kilometers in length and narrow, 100 kilometers wide. You've got the storm-enhanced densities that John Forst has spent a lot of time explaining coming up over the US during storms. And of course, you've got equatorial spread F and plasma bubbles. So this is just a few of the many uh, structures I listed. And then, of course, you've got time variations. This is a snapshot of the Bastille Day storm. It's a one-hour snapshot. You're looking down on the auroral oval. And you could see every 10 minutes how the auroral oval changes. And this also shows you the structure in the system. OK, so clearly things are highly dynamic, and the scales are quite small. OK, so what do we need from the magnetospheric physicist? If you're looking at convection, precipitation, and currents, um, what we need is we need models or measurements that can give us a 20-kilometer spatial resolution horizontally and a one-minute time scale. So this is, again, a nice challenge for young people making measurements or developing models to get to this level. All right, this is a, a picture of all the ion acceleration processes that are known to occur in, in the polar region to produce outflow. OK, so you have a, a continuous loss of plasma, ions and neutrals, from the ionosphere. 
So if we look down here, this is what I call a classical polar wind. It's driven by pressure gradients, temperature enhancements, joule heating, enhanced electron temperatures. But then you got a whole bunch that I don't have time to go into. This afternoon from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, we'll have a session to go into these details. But the trick to note is it's continuous, okay? Now this is just the simple swarm that we did many, many years ago. It was 1989. We had simple convection and precipitation patterns. They were empirical. We varied them in time. There was no structure in them, varied them in time. And then we had a st simulated a storm. And even for those simple patterns that were constant in time initially, then we varied KP to let the empirical models vary. You can see this is altitude, latitude across the polar cap, noon, magnetic pole, midnight. And this is the O plus outflow. It's a snapshot at a given instant of time. And you can see it's highly variable. Um, and you get jets going up, some are stationary, some are propagating, and this is not with a data simulation model for the convection and precipitation. If you look at H plus, again, H plus altitude across the polar cap, latitude, and you see not only is this structure, this structure with altitude. You got these blobs peeling off and flowing up into the magnetosphere. So one views the outflow as a campfire. You got flickering flames that separate from the rest of the flame, and you got a continuous variation in space and time in your campfire with a lot of the outflow occurring near the edges of the campfire. Okay, so that's how you have to view the outflow as a flickering flame campfire. However, that's just, you still got some more complications because as O plus flows up in the, due to ion outflow, H plus flows up, they can charge exchange and they grab an electron and it becomes a neutral O stream. So in addition to having O plus and H plus flowing up, you got O streams and H plus and H streams flowing up. H plus, H plus flowing up at 10 kilometers per second, 3 kilometers per second could charge exchange, and then you get an H stream flowing up. As it turns out, all the H have enough energy to escape, just like H plus, but typically O, the O streams don't, they come back down. Here's a little schematic of that. You got, here's the cusp. You got charge exchange, neutrals coming down on both sides. You got anti sunward convection. So any charge exchange moves this way. If it's a O, it'll come right back down in a parabolic orbit. If it's, a, if it's an H, it'll go up into the magnetosphere. So again, the fluxes, Tom Moore measured these. They're 10 to the 9 centimeter per, per centimeter squared per second. And they're large, very large, comparable and larger than the ion O plus and H plus fluxes. So you have to take that into account. So the question is, why do we have oceans? This was brought up, I think, 10 to 15 years ago. It was uh, when the Akabono satellite flew. A Japanese scientist mentioned this once in one of the meetings. And if you take all the H going up and all the H plus going up, and then you just look at the O plus that's leaving, and you take 2H for each O, that's water. He then did a calculation looking at the flow outflow over the both polar caps as a function of time. And if you integrate back a billion years, we should have no oceans. So there's two things that could occur. Either we have no oceans, and I think most of you believe we do, except maybe from young, some, some young students who were born and never left New Mexico. <laughs> but we do have oceans. So what does that mean? That means either the outflow has not been going on for a billion years, maybe only 100 million, a couple of million, or there's a return flow, OK? And that brings me to what we need. We need to separately model H plus going into the magnetosphere from the ionosphere and have that separate and distinct from H plus coming into the magnetosphere from the solar wind. We need two H plus species, one that's on from the ionosphere, one from the solar wind, and we need to track to see if there's a return flow. I have a strong suspicion that there is a return flow, um, and that suspicion is enhanced every time I go to the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans. So that. And we need to attract H as well to C. Okay, so the magnetospheric modelers only have one H plus species in their modeling. So there's no, so what we need from them is multiple H plus species and an H species. Okay, so that's one problem. The next one is um, magnetosphere, um, ionosphere, electron interactions. As the polar wind flows up, it's neutral. There are as many electrons as there are ions. These thermal electrons flow up and they interact with the polar rain, squall, and drizzle. Now the polar rain is over the polar cap at all times and it's nearly uniform. 
but the polar squall and drizzle are not uniform. When the electrons go up, two things can happen. One is they interact with the hot electrons, the polar rain, and that heat is then conducted down into the ionosphere. The other thing is if the hot electrons, the density is high enough, you could get a contact surface form, a double layer form, so that the electrons coming up, the thermal electrons, are, rev are turned around by this double layer electric field, come back down, and then the hot electrons pick up the rest of the ambipolar flow. And if you have a double layer, then the ions are accelerated out at a greater speed, the thermal ions. So this is just, again, um, suppose we have this heat conduction coming down into the ionosphere. Is it important? Well, this is no heat conduction. This is the NMF2, the peak density in the F region. This is no heat conduction coming down. This is 0.5 times 10 to the 10 electron volts per centimeter squared per second, and this is 1.5. 1.5 is a value that's consistent with measurements, okay? So you have a heat flow through the top of the ionosphere because of escaping polar wind electrons interacting with the hot polar rain electrons. This is a typical value. If you do a model simulation and look at does it affect NMF2, the peak density in the ionosphere, here's without the heat flow, here's with the heat flow, you get factors of two to 10 difference. So without knowing that heat flow, you'll never pin down the high latitude, uh, high latitude ionosphere, which means you'll never get the right thermosphere. So again, to make it, let me just, I'm gonna go through this quickly. The other one is, we took a uh, convecting trajectory, cut across the polar cap, and then we had polar rain at high altitudes to provide a hot electrons. We let the polar wind electrons go through it. And what I'm showing here is the total, the, it's the hot electron population in a polar rain versus the total. That's the thermal electrons from the polar wind plus the hot added together. And above a certain altitude, the ratio is one, meaning the hot electrons dominate up there and the thermal electrons dominate below, below the contact layer. So depending on the temperature ratio between the hot and the cold, you could get a sharp contact layer. And that contact layer moves every time the pressure in the ionosphere varies. So this double layer is moving up and down and it's distributed non-uniformly over the polar cap. And in that contact layer, there's a double, a double layer electric field that points upward, H plus is accelerated. Okay, so that brings me to the, what do we need from the magnetospheric community? They have to have more than one electron species in their models. Right now they have one electron species. We need separate electron species for polar rain, squall and drivel. Squall and drivel, drizzle, they are highly nonlinear spatially. They, you know, they're, they're non-uniform, I should say, spatially, so we need to model them. Uh, so we need multiple electron populations in addition to multiple H plus populations in the magnetospheric models. Okay, then there you look at the, you look at the solar wind, you look at the ionosphere, you look at the plasma sphere, you look at the polar wind. The distribution functions are non-Maxwellian in all these regions. Even in the Earth's upper atmosphere, the thermosphere, the distribution functions become non-Maxwellian in certain domains. Now to give you the clue, if you have a heat flow in your species or gas, the distribution is non-Maxwellian. If you had a pure Maxwellian, there's no heat flow. So even in this room, students, you can do it in your, in your this is a homework problem. Put your hand near a lamp and pull it away. You're gonna see that the temperature drops. It's a heat flow. The distribution function in that room is non-Maxwellian. So if you look at the polar wind, you got a wide range of non-Maxwellian distributions. You got beams, uh, bi-Maxwellians, elongated tails in the upward direction. You got double peaks, pancake distributions, connex, counterstreaming. All these have been measured in the polar wind, okay? I'll give you a couple examples. If you had a drifting Maxwellian, you'd have concentric spheres in 3D. The dot in the middle, the center, is the drift velocity. It might be 10 kilometers per second, five kilometers per second. And then the contours of constant distribution would be concentric spheres. If you cut that in two, you get a bullseye target, okay? So this is parallel velocity to the magnetic field. This is perpendicular. Here's a toroidal distribution. The distribution function looks like a donut. I must be hungry. I don't know why I said donut. Toroidal sounds more scientific, doesn't it? Yeah. But at any rate, it's a, it's a toroidal distribution. That's been measured, okay? You have a pancake distribution. And that'll then fold into a conic. They've been measured. You have double peak distributions. They exist in the ionosphere polar wind. And these are all primarily polar wind and ion outflow distributions. So that brings to the mind, 
What do we need? We need to determine the stability of the magnetosphere in the presence of all these non-Maxwellian distributions. You're not just getting density and velocity going in from O plus outflow. You're getting non-Maxwellian distributions, and that'll affect how, when you develop a model, you should take into collisions. Okay, you can't use the standard collision process. You can't use the standard wave expressions. You have to come up with new ones to take into account that the distribution functions that you're dealing with are non-Maxwellian. So again, the field, in my mind, for the young people, it's really wide open. There's so much work that can be done in the next decade, new fundamental research that has not been done. Okay, this is the last issue. Um, and I should point out that I think this is still true, but it might not be true. Maybe the MHD magnetospheric models have been improved late, late, lately. But the statement is true that, you know, Wyman's empirical model of plasma convection still typically beats the MHD models when it comes to calculating electric fields. Is that true, Weimer? Maybe you know it. Let me blame you so I don't get yelled at. But I think it's true. If not, I can definitely say that they're having trouble beating Weimer. So the global models of the magnetosphere, the MHD models, are having trouble beating Weimer at the very least or tying it. Um, clearly, the addition of O plus into the code has been a major change and a big improvement. And now they're starting to connect some kinetic models connected with the ring current and coupling that to the magnetosphere. That's a major improvement. But to me, a fundamental flaw with the models is the energy equation. P pressure equals some constant times the mass density rho to the gamma. If gamma is 1, the whole magnetosphere is at the same temperature. It's isothermal. So any energy put in somewhere is instantly convected to the rest of the magnetosphere. That violates Einstein's theory of general relativity. So clearly, that can't be true. As it turns out, what's typically used is gamma equals 5 thirds. OK? 5 thirds is adiabatic expansion and contraction. That means there is no heat flow in the magnetosphere. Clearly, that doesn't make sense either. OK? And if you use the, the, the um, typical MHD equations, the ideal MHD equations, you assume that the distribution function of the magnetosphere is Maxwellian at all times at all places. Well, in the thermosphere, it's not. In the ionosphere, it's not. Polar wind, plasma sphere, it's not. In the solar wind, it's not. So it can't possibly be true that it's Maxwellian in the magnetosphere. So to my mind, in order to get down to the scales we need and get better results from the global MHD models of the magnetosphere, which are, it's a powerful approach to solve those tremendous um, dimensions that you have to worry about, in the magnetosphere, the next postdoc student, because some of us old senior citizens aren't going to do the work, the next postdoc or student that replaces this with a new energy equation is going to become famous overnight and well known. So I hope I can motivate you to do this. OK, so what's needed? We need to improve the energy equation in the global MHD magnetosphere models to include collisionless heat flow, which is going on and wave-induced heat flow. Clear, now, there are a lot of expressions out there. There are a lot of transport equations and kinetic approaches out there where you can do collisionless heat flow and wave-induced heat flows. And I think we got this, the computer speed now that attacking this problem is viable. Last slide. It's just a summary. OK, so I'm, I'm giving you at least a decade or more of work we need 20 kilometer resolution from the modeling and measurements, and one minute temporal resolution to model the ionosphere th thermosphere system correctly. We need to separately model the H plus from the ionosphere and the H plus from the solar wind. Then we need to account for all the H coming out, neutral H from the polar wind. We need to separately model the different electron populations in the magnetosphere in an MHD type model or into a, just a multi fluid or transport type model, polar rain, squall, and drizzle. We need to determine the stability of the magnetosphere at the very least when you're allowing for O plus inflow into the magnetosphere. What happens to your analysis if the distribution function of O plus is non-Maxwellian? Non does that matter and to what extent does it matter when you're saying I got this inflow? Right now people are just, to my knowledge, are just using a mass inflow, a mass density inflow. You got a density and a mass and a velocity. But what if the distribution is non-Maxwellian? Okay. And then 
We need to improve the energy equation. In my opinion, that's a significant improvement in global MHD magnetosphere modeling. And at that point, I'll stop. Thank you.